clock is ticking. <laughs> it's a bomb. Try to focus right here, okay? <laughs> focus. Two eyes. Mike, what's up there? What is that? <laughs> <laughs> We're preaching on gluttony tonight, so that'll work just fine. Amen. <laughs> I believe America is the greatest country on earth. I, I love this country. I am as American as you can be. I, I'm as Floridian as you can be, to be honest with you. I love Florida. Um, I miss it when I'm away. It's, got, it's good to be back. Um, we live in a great country. We live in probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest country that has ever been on the face of this earth. And if you go out on the streets of Fort Lauderdale and you ask anyone, hey, are you proud to be an American? I would expect that if somebody lives in this country, that they would say, yes, I, I'm a patriot. I love America. I, I, I'm for the wet, red, wed, red, white, and blue. America is the home and the brave and the land of the free. And people love this country. But you know if I were to go out to the streets of Fort Lauderdale and I were to ask that question, I'm sure that would be the response I would get. But if you spent time talking to those same people and you asked them, why are you proud to be an American? What is so great about this country, this America that you love? Why are you a patriot? What is it that makes America so special, so different? You know, the ignorance out there from the responses that you will hear are pretty striking. And actually, some of them are pretty embarrassing. Because while people will say, I love America, and I love, uh, and I'm glad to be an American, very few people <clears throat> can tell you why they love America. There's a recent survey that I had looked up and found. Here, th this survey was attempting to gauge the knowledge of, of U.S. <laughs> citizens and their knowledge of history, at least the history of our country. And the results came back with some of these. Uh, more Americans in the survey identify, were able to identify songs written by Michael Jackson than they were able to identify the Bill of Rights as a body of amendments to the U.S. Constitution. In fact, more than a third in this survey did not even know what century the American Revolution <laughs> took place. Half of the respondents in this survey believe that the Civil War, the uh, Emancipation Proclamation of the War of 1812, were both before the American Revolution. Another survey I found, uh, it gave some similar results. Only 42% in this survey were, were able to place the Battle of the Bulge even in the history of World War II. A third of these uh, respondents, they were actually college graduates. I didn't say that these ones were college graduates, this next survey here. They didn't even know that FDR had introduced the New Deal. And half of them had never heard of Ro Teddy Roosevelt and had no idea that he played a major role in the Panama Canal deal. A third of them did, could not place the Civil War in a correct 20-year timeline. <laughs> Only 22% of them could even match this phrase. Uh, the government of the people, by the people, and for the people, only 22% were able to put that in the Gettysburg Address. That's amazing, isn't it? That while today people say, I love America. I, I, love that this, I love this country. If you were to ask them, what is America? I took this one off because you know, the list was pretty extensive. But a question in order, in order for you to get into the U.S. is, you know, are we a pure democracy? Or, you know, I can't remember how the question is worded, versus a republic. And uh, most in this survey got that wrong. They had no idea how to identify America as a democratic republic. It's amazing, isn't it, how many people are ignorant about what America stands for today. Of course, I, I believe that what everyone said, would say out on the street, you know, is, is right. I believe all of us should be able to stand here. If you live in America, you should... You ought to believe that this is the best country on earth. But you know, if you think this is a great country, it would it'd be helpful to know why. There's a famous saying that goes, and I don't know if you've heard it, uh, if you think education is expensive, 
Try ignorance. In other words, if, if you think it costs too much uh, to, to, to gain knowledge, if it's too hard to work hard and to, to learn, imagine how much it's going to cost you to be unlearned, or if I can use or coin the word dumb. <laughs> Ask yourself, how high, are you, how high of a price are you willing to pay to be ignorant? Think about it. What are you willing to pay? What, what, at what cost are you willing to not know something? As you think about that question, I, I want to introduce you tonight to a man who had a strong faith in the Lord. This man had confidence in Jehovah God. He, he walked with the Lord, and you're going to find out that his faith became a testimony for generations to come. This man lived in the days of the Judges. If you have your Bibles, open up with me to the book of Judges. We're going to be in Judges 10 through 11 tonight. In Judges 10, verse number 6, you're introduced... Excuse me, we come across the, the children of Israel again who had once again walked away from the Lord. In chapter 10, verse 6, it says, And the children of Israel did evil again. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And just kind of hone into that word, again. This is the sixth time that the nation, up to this point in the book of Judges, has turned their back on God. It's the sixth time they've allowed gods from the surrounding nations, nations which in Joshua, God told them to cast out. This is the sixth time they've allowed these nations, gods, to be a part of their country. They had brought in gods from nations all over the Mediterranean. They had brought in gods from beyond the River Jordan. River, or gods even from the nation of the Philistines, their worst enemies. And they had adopted a lot of the practices of these pagan gods, lifestyles of idolatry. Lifestyles which included not just sexual looseness, but the sacrifice of children. And for a while, God doesn't punish them. Uh, he, he leaves them for a while. In fact, I think it was about 20 years. But eventually, the Lord judges them. He begins to punish them and Judges 10, yet again, he brings the Philistines in from the west and the Ammonites come in from the east and they begin to kind of chew away at the borders of the country. The Ammonites in this passage, they, and we're not going to, we don't have time to go through the whole passage, but as you read through it, they felt they had a claim to the land, especially that part which is beyond Jordan. And so these Ammonites, they begin to attack. They attack the tribes living uh, on the east, and eventually they move in to attack the central tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And then, as the story goes all throughout the book of Judges, the spiral, as the children of Israel see the consequences of their foolishness, they begin to regret what they've done. And this time, they come back to the Lord, but God, God does not hear them. Look with me at Judges 10, verse 13. God is saying here, look, you know, you've, you've been so interested in all these other gods. You've wanted to worship them. Uh, go worship them. Let them save you. He says, I'm going to deliver you no more. In verse 13, he says, you have forsaken me and served other gods. I, wherefore, I will deliver you no more. Go and cry unto the gods which you forsake which you've chosen, let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. So he says, I'm not going to deliver you anymore. Of course, the children of Israel, they, they don't hear it. They, they still, they, they fall upon the Lord and, and beg for forgiveness. And while it doesn't say directly that God is going to deliver them, you see the heart of God here. It says that he, it becomes hurt because of their cry. Uh, look, look what it says here in verse number 16. It says that his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. He became grieved 
They became weary because of their cry. And so here in chapter 11, we're introduced to this man of faith. His name is Jephthah. As you look in your Bibles in Jephthah chapter 11, in verse 1, you, you learn immediately that Jephthah was a, he was a, man, he was a man of Gilead. I find that quite interesting to be, uh, there's disagreement on what that really is. You know, he's, he's a son of Gilead, and yet he's, he's from Gilead, so I find that kind of ironic. Uh, but it says that Gilead, the land or the, or the father, Gilead actually begot Jephthah. You wonder if there's some irony there. Uh, Jephthah, it, the Bible says here, was a mighty man of valor. He knew how to fight. He knew how to wage battle and win. But Jephthah had some things going against him. Jephthah was the son of a harlot. He was a bastard child. We read in verse 1, Now Jephthah the Gilead, the Gilead was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of a an harlot. And Gilead begot Jephthah. And Gilead's wife bare him sons. And as the sons begin to grow, the, the verse here says that they begin to pick on Jephthah. He's not a legitimate child, you know. Uh, he's not really one of us. And so you can just imagine the stress Jephthah went through as he was growing up, as everyone continued to reject him and push him out. And eventually, it gets to the point where Jephthah is banished and he's forced to leave. It says that Jephthah fled from his brethren and he goes to the land of Tal, Tob, Tob. Actually, I forgot, I never looked up how to pronounce that, so pick one. He goes to the land of Tob and he finds a group of guys and pretty quickly he's got a following. And he's cast out. And the interesting thing is if you read through this passage, it's very similar to the way they treat him. It's like so similar to the way they treated the Lord, isn't it? You know, God, uh, they, want, they wanted nothing to do with the Lord and they, they turn their back on the Lord. Of course, when they need God, they come crawling back to him and begging him to deliver them. And as they did with the Lord, so now they do with Jephthah. We read in chapter 12, which we're not going to be looking at tonight, that Jephthah judged Israel six years. And so Jephthah was a judge. And he, uh, he's, as he's in the land of Tob, it says at the end of chapter 10, that the people and the princes of Gilead said to one another, What man is he that will begin to fight against the children of Ammon? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. And they begin to remember Jephthah, and they remember that, you know, this guy, he knew how to fight, and oh, it's as if, you know, the light goes on. What have we done? They uh, call Jephthah, and they, they beg him to return, and they uh, beg for forgiveness, wanting Jephthah to come and to, <clears throat> to lead them. But uh, Jephthah, he, he's a pretty wise guy. He's not, he's not hearing it. So right away, you know, he says, look, you, know, you, you cast me out, and... Now you need me, and you, you're just going to bring me back in? I mean, how does, it, how does this work? And so Jephthah says, no, 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 no. That's not the way it's going to go. I, I need some, something more here. And he asks them, to, you give me your word. If I fight this battle and, and I win, hey, I'm, I'm going to be your head, right? I'm going I'm to be able to stay and, and lead over you. And they said, yeah, Jephthah, whatever you want. And the elders of Gideon said, <clears throat> in verse number Ten, the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, The Lord be witness between us if we do not so according to thy word. So yeah, Jephthah, whatever you want, you can, you, can be, uh, you can be head over us. And so Jephthah agrees. But Jephthah begins to show his, his confidence and his commitment to the Lord. Because <clears throat> it says here, Actually, that's a little further down. Excuse me. Jephthah, well, he wasn't just a mighty man of valor. Jephthah was also a pretty pretty wise uh, negotiator. And he, he comes here and he begins to negotiate with the children of Ammon. And he talks with them and explains how they had no right of the land. You know, you, you guys, th this isn't right. He, he, he uses history and he explains how you know, God had given Israel the land and he explains why they had lost it. And he uses common sense that you know, God is judge, and I love that verse. He calls God the judge here. And he even uses reason, trying to get these uh, Ammonites to understand that this is right for them to give Israel back the land. <laughs> he doesn't want to fight it first. But if you were anything like the king of Ammon, he had an army, and he had, he had all the ability to fight. He, he wasn't ready to give it up. Nothing Jephthah was saying was really going to impress him. And so, 
the battle is on. And Jephthah, he begins to pray and to turn unto the Lord. <coughs> he says in verse 27, after they had determined that the battle was going to happen, in verse 27, Jephthah says, I have not sinned against thee, but thou doest me wrong to war against the, the Lord. The Lord, the judge, be judged this day between the children of Israel and the children of Ammon. And if you, there's a verse here I, I didn't write down, but throughout this passage it says that Jephthah uh, brings all of this before the Lord. And he seeks guidance and wisdom from God. <clears throat> and the, the, the passage says here that in verse 29, that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. And when God's Spirit comes upon him, because of his confidence in the Lord, and because of the power that is now upon him, Jephthah is ready for battle. And the faith that Jephthah shows here in this passage, his, his commitment to the Lord and his willingness to trust in the Lord, and as we said the other day, not in himself, one day will earn Jephthah a rightful place in the book of Hebrews, in the hall of faith. And in Hebrews 11, when the writer of Hebrews is illustrating what it means to have faith in the Lord. It begins to mention some of these judges in the book of Judges. In, in verse 32 in Hebrews 11, the writer says this, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah and of David also and of Samuel and of the prophets. And this is why, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. Uh, skip down to the end of verse 32. Out of weakness, these men by faith were made strong. And they, these, these men, including these judges, waxed valiant in fight and turned to fight the armies of the aliens. And Jephthah, because of his faith, because of his confidence in the Lord, he was able to win a great victory that day. And God was able to use Jephthah. It says here in verse 29 that the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him. And he's on his way to the battle. <clears throat> but you notice, with all of Jephthah's strength, with all that Jephthah was able to accomplish and is about to accomplish for the Lord, you know, like so many people in this book, Jephthah had a problem. Jephthah had faith in the God of Israel. And friend, that's, that's so easily apparent as you read through Judges 10 and all the way through the, end, the, the middle part of Judges 11. But even with all of his faith, Jephthah had become influenced by the nations surrounding Israel, just like all the other people of his day. As someone would say that Jephthah, he was a, he was a man of his own time, wasn't he? Uh, as it, Jephthah heads off to Ammon to fight. He does something unexpected. Jephthah does something that, you know, as you're reading through the story, you don't really, you're not really prepared for. He does something we weren't ready for. He commits something to the Lord. It's stuck right in the middle here. And in verse 29, as you read, you know, if you were to skip down to verse 22 or 32, let's go ahead and do that. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead. And you get the excitement here. And Manasseh and passed over Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he passes over unto the children of Ammon. Verse 32, so Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. And it was a great victory that day. But tucked away right in the middle of these verses, Jephthah makes a mistake. In verse 30, it says that Jephthah makes a vow. You see, Jephthah had grown up with idolatry. We said that a moment ago. And so even though Jephthah was sensitive to the Lord, he was also, like the rest of Israel, surrounded by the gods of his day. Jephthah had become influenced by the pagan gods 
of other lands. And you know, it would have been completely natural for those, for the people in the countries around, those of pagan gods, it would have been completely natural for them uh, to work, to offer a child sacrifice unto an idol. And so j just as Jephthah was a servant of the Lord, he was a servant of his day. He wins the battle. It's an exciting battle. Uh, it says here in verse 32, we read about that. But it says, and Jephthah vows a vow unto the Lord, and he says, God, I want you to give me victory. And, and, and it, Lord, this is what I'm going to do. If you'll just give me victory, you know, whatever, when I come back from the battle, what, the first thing that comes from, through the door of my house, I'm going to offer it up unto you as a sacrifice. I'm going to give it unto the Lord. And so he makes that vow. It says, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth from the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, surely that will be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for the burnt offering. And so very quickly, the story goes on, and Jephthah goes off, and he, he wins a great battle. And it says that the Lord delivered them into his hands. And Jephthah's excited, and all of Israel's excited, and they begin to head home. <clears throat> and on the way home, Jephthah, you can just see him coming over the hill, you know, towards his house. His daughter by then had heard the news. She had heard that the victory had been won and she'd been excited, you know, preparing a party for, in celebration for her dad. She comes out and she, uh, as Jephthah's coming home, she runs through the doorway, so excited to meet her dad and Jephthah knows immediately that he's made a mistake. And, and the passage says that he rebukes his daughter. He rebukes her because of what's happened. As you look at his daughter, what's interesting is that it doesn't even name her. Because, they don't, because there's no future for her. Uh, look, look what it says here in verse 34. And Jephthah came to Mizpah into his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and dances. Uh, notice, though, what God puts here very quickly. And she was his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. This was the only future that Jephthah, the only hope for a future Jephthah had. Without her, there would be no future for his family. His lineage would stop right here. And so he rebukes his daughter. But when he explains to her the vow, the daughter, uh, her confidence and her her. Her commitment to the Lord is amazing. She says, look, you've, you've made a vow. And she says, we've got to follow through with it. And the story goes that she uh, asks for two months to wail her virginity. And then after that, the Bible says in verse 39, and it came to pass at the end of those two months that she returned unto her father who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed. And she knew no man. And it was a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah. Notice, not Jephthah. The Gilead, four days in the year. And in the end, Jephthah's skewed understanding of God leads him to offer his daughter as a burnt sacrifice. His vow shows not just Jephthah's own Canaanized understanding of God, but it shows the, the heart of what was going on in the nation of Israel. How that every man did that which is right in their own eyes. They saw God in some ways just like any other pagan god. And because of that, even in chapter 12, you're going to find that the mistakes are going to grow. And a lot of, a lot of people like to see the book of Judges. From here on out, it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Yeah. There's a coined phrase. In 1889, it was coined by a, an American journalist. His name was Edgar Nye. He'd become famous for a phrase that he'd coined because of a river that he had found, or that he'd identified in the Midwestern and United States. The, the river was called the Platte River. Uh, the Platte River was a, a muddy, wide, it was a shallow river. It uh, was swampy, but it was very, very wide. And though it was so big, it was a huge river. He soon writes of the river, and this is, I quote, he said it had a very large circulation, but very little influence. It covers a good deal of ground, but it's not very deep. In some places, 
He said it's even a mile wide and three quarters of an inch deep. And so the phrase is born, a mile wide and an inch deep. Of course, you understand the phrase is not meant to be a compliment. The phrase is meant, it ends up being used later in politics and uh, in all other kinds of fields. It's used to describe somebody whose knowledge is lacking. Uh, you know, you might feel that you have a strong faith in the Lord. And that's a great thing. I think it's important to have faith in, in God. I think it's, a have, it's important to have faith in the Lord. But you know what? Sometimes if we have faith in the wrong thing, we, we can have a wrong understanding of God. And because of that, we might do things in God's name that God never intended. If you don't know who God is, Christian, if you've never spent time in this book, you might have put your faith in Christ. But you can have a skewed understanding of the Lord. And if you do that, you might think God wants you to do something that He would never have dreamed of in your life. Strong faith is important, but faith in the wrong thing is so dangerous. Bad theology can destroy anybody. And you know, that's what Jephthah had. He had a, he had a faith in the Lord. But Jephthah had bad theology. You know, someone has said this, that the more committed a person is in the wrong thing, the more dangerous they become. You know, some people actually believe that God has chosen certain people. And believe me, I'm not, I'm not bashing these people today at all. But that God, for no apparent reason, actually has already decided on who can be saved and who cannot be saved. And, you know, there are some people that actually believe that. Friend, if you believe that, can I tell you something? That's a skewed understanding of God. Yes, sir. Uh, that's bad theology. There are some people that actually believe uh, that God's grace is... They have a skewed understanding of grace. They live most of their lives in depression and defeat. Why? Because although they, they understand that God's grace, you know, it, it was able to save them, but daily grace, you know, it's, it's expensive. It costs a lot. For God to forgive sin in the life of a Christian. You know, Christian, if you believe that, that's that's bad theology. That, that's not true. Do you know that if grace isn't free, it's not grace at all? If, if God can't give grace freely, he, then He can't call it grace. And some people, they have been discipled to believe that for a person to be saved, you know, there, there's this is all going to be evident in their life. And there are people that at one point thought they had they had come to faith in the Lord, but now they're beginning to struggle. You know, I don't see surrender in my life. I don't see any fruit in my life. I can't. You know, Lord, friend, that's bad theology. Jephthah, I believe he did love the Lord. But, you know, Jephthah was a man of his time. But Jephthah, uh, he, he, I think he had the opportunity to know a lot more about God than he ever did. But because of his ignorance, because of his, uh, his skewed understanding of God, he made some big mistakes in his life. And so what's the, what's the message for us tonight? Friend, have faith in God. My, my prayer is that you walk by faith every day of your life. But, but do understand something. Uh, have faith in God, but have an understanding of God that is rooted in the truth of Scripture. And so when you, uh, when you are confident, you know that you're confident in something that's in this book. Because uh, God is not going to uh, be blamed for our mistakes. You understand what I'm saying, don't you? Have a right theology. You know, there are some churches out there today, you know, they say, you know, what's important to us? It's, we, we just focus on, on love. And, you know, we, just, we just want to focus on the important things. And, uh, we, we don't get all messed up in that theology stuff, you know. So uh, we just like to uh, teach people uh, that God loves them and, and He cares about them. No, I'm just, I shouldn't do that. <laughs> we won't name any names. <laughs> but you know, friend, that's bad theology. And so uh, make sure that your faith is rooted in, in, in a biblical, biblical theology. That's the message tonight. I'm going to close uh, with a word of prayer and ask for God's mercy. On all of that, uh, right there, <laughs> and with that, uh, Pastor, we'll just we'll just be dismissed, or I'll turn the service. Yeah. Just close in prayer, and we'll, we'll uh, have a uh, uh, prayer for Michael. Prayer for Michael. Yeah, for God's okay, <laughs> and we'll also pray for the food. Father, thank you.
God, for just, just the fact that we could be here tonight. Thank you so much for um, blessing your people here. Thank you for this church. Lord, we thank you so much for Michael and his testimony. Thank you for the Miller family. Thank you for bringing them to us tonight. Uh, this little reunion, I, I, I'm excited to spend the evening with them and uh, catching up. I pray that you, uh, Lord, bless this time of fellowship. Thank you for, for providing for the food. But Lord, we do pray for Michael and his life. That Lord, you just have your hand on him and uh, the ministry that you've given the Millers up there in Jupiter. Uh, we pray for their church, that you bless the church there. And uh, Lord, we just ask for your blessing on all of our lives as we are dismissed and as we go home throughout the week. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we open up the scriptures and as we study your word, that we would have a good and a pure understanding of who you are and your grace and how much you love us. We do pray for your blessing now. And we pray it all through Christ. Amen. With that, you're dismissed. And I don't know how you want to work all that out. But we'll get set up and then once they start eating, Mike will go first. And then after that, the parents would...